thank you for coming. It's for your benefit. Um, so we'll start off with a case, 27-year-old person with uh, unilateral pain, redness, photophobia, and ciliary flush is pictured here. Recurrent episodes of bilateral alternating non-granulomous anterior with lower back pain. Differential diagnosis, okay? So differential diagnosis of unilateral of anterior non-granulomous anterior uveitis. So number one, idiopathic, then the HLA B27 associated uh, spondyloarthropathies, which includes ankylosing spondylitis, reactive arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and psoriatic arthritis. Then um, herpes can do anything, okay? Lens induced, Bechet's drug associated uveitis, always remember drugs as a possible cause of uveitis. TINU and Posner Schlossman. Okay. Hypopan uveitis, as you can see here in a patient with Big Shetz disease. So, the kind of history that you would want to get in a patient like this is a history of, you know, arthralgias, low back pain, oral and genital ulcers. So, many uh, anterior uveitis can give you oral and genital ulcers, not just Big Shetz disease. Skin lesions, GI, and medication use. Um, I think that your labs can be tailored. Uh, CBC differential and metabolic profile may or may not be indicated, but certainly, you know, an HLA B27 in a patient with lower back pain, you know, 80% of patients, you know, 50% of patients supposedly are positive for B27, you know, and a very high percentage of those patients may have an underlying uh, spondyloarthropathy. Um, if you need to get films, uh, you know, lumbosacral films are not very helpful in terms of ankylosing spondylitis because the action is in the sacroiliac joint. And these days probably uh, they get MR, you know, rather than plain films. And then urinary beta-2 microglobulin is a actually very good test for, uh, screening test for tubular interstitial lymphitis and uveitis syndrome, which is typically non-granulomous but bilateral. Anybody knows what these signing findings are? Right, on the right, and that's associated with? Writers. Okay, which yeah. is no longer Cole Writers, right, because of, he was a Nazi, and they're expunging him from the lexicon, uh, along with Wegener. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah, that's right, and then, of course, Cersonate Balanitis. Sorry, it's early. Um, this is a, a slide of um, delayed onset endophthalmitis. What is, what is the kind of, you know, one of the findings here that might give it away. A uh, patient comes in post-op, he's had uh, you know, post-operative inflammation, give him steroids, it comes back. Any particular finding on this particular photograph that might help you? So typically, um, you know, in pa plaque. yeah, a capsular plaque. So patients with um, delayed onset endophthalmitis, and, and that includes not only propionobacteria acnes, which is a common fastidious organism that you see in that, but also, um, you know, fungal uh, organisms. Um, a, uh, the organisms like to hang out in, in the capsule, in the capsule plaque, okay? So you can actually induce this by sometimes yagging patients. But um, in terms of the treatment, you, the, capsule, the, the capsule needs to be removed, along with intravitreal vancomycin and vitreous biopsy. So iris nodules. Anybody want to tell me what these nodules are? What about the ones that are near the pupillary margin? What are those called? Kepi. Kepi. You can remember that, you know, kepi with a P in the pupillary margin. And then Pisaka nodules are more in the stroma. Okay, this is actually a patient with sarcoidosis. This patient was treated with prednisone and a topical corticosteroids, and these nodules went away. Herpetic keratoid uveitis, these are classic signs that you might see in a patient with herpetic keratoid uveitis. On the right is a uh, immune ulcer, you know, immune stromal uh, reaction, kind of like an octromony uh, plate. And then on the right uh, is sectoral iris atrophy, okay? Board question, true or false? Sectoral iris atrophy is pathognomonic of Rasella zoster keratoid uveitis. False. False. Why is that? You can see it in the HSPA. That's right. It, that's so. It was classically taught that, but you. Could, but it's a very useful sign. Okay. It's usually due to ischemia of the iris. Okay. 
and um, it is uh, not necessarily pathognomonic. Um, just clinically, I, you know, UVIs with diffusely distributed keratotic precipitates, herpes, you know, varicella, and then also think about sarcoidosis, Fuchs heterochromic iridosis, like what uveitis syndrome, and uh, toxoplasmosis. Differential diagnosis of uh, hypertensive uveitis, okay, herpes until proven otherwise, including CMV, okay, because patients, uh, immunocompetent patients can develop CMV. Uh, uveitis is uncommon in these parts of the world, but uh, more common in Asia. Uh, Posner Schlossman syndrome, uh, Fuchs heterochromic uveitis syndrome, sarcoidosis, and toxo. So that's kind of the differential. Okay, 25-year-old white guy presents his first episode of non-granulomous atrial uveitis with unilateral hypopion. So it's kind of the differential hypopion uveitis. What laboratory test is the most appropriate? What's the answer to this question? Like an What's that? Well, so guys presenting with hypopion, do you want to like just let him uh, give him a hall pass? No, probably not. Right? Yeah, I would go with C, right? Uh, so pro them, probably the most common cause of hypopion uveitis is HLA-B27 associated disease. But it can be, you know, uh, bad things, okay, like uh, leukemia and uh, endophthalmitis, but the history should help you with that. And every patient with um, uveitis gets a, gets a te serological test for syphilis. Um, why wouldn't ANA and rheumatoid factor be appropriate? Well, you would test that maybe in a child with chronic non-granulomous uveitis. Usually, it doesn't present with a hypopion uveitis. Okay, and uh, lupus, you know, usually doesn't produce uveitis at all. Okay, so a 35-year-old white guy presents with pain, redness, photophobia, and vision, really bad vision in his right eye. He has mutton fat keratoprecipitase, precipitase, a microhyphema, and red blood cells in his anterior chamber. Okay, white cells and flare, no posterior sneak in, intraocular pressure of 50. Okay, what are we thinking about in this patient? Hypertensive uveitis. What's the patient's What's the yeah, so her, you, that's probably the first thought that should enter your mind. Um, there's a little bit of a hyphema. Is that consistent with a herpetic uveitis? What happens to the iris? Schemic, right? So you can actually get some hyphema. Okay. So what finding would you expect to see here? Or might you expect to see? What would be the answer to this question? B. B, yeah, okay, this is the kind of stuff they ask you on the board, you know, it's not exactly, you know, straightforward clinically stuff. Okay, in contrast, 12-year-old girl um, with non-granulomous anterior chronic, white eye, as you can see here, posterior subcapsular cataract, and, um, you know, oligoarticular arthritis. What are you thinking about in this eye? JAA or, or chronic anterior uveitis in kids, which can be exactly like JAA, okay? So Fuchs can, in adults, uh, it can be this way. Fuchs frequently will have just, you know, very low-grade cell, no posterior sneakia, and uh, high pressure and cataract, right? Always think about syphilis, sarcoid, TB, herpes, and then immune recovery uveitis. So the workup would be a little bit, you know, more extensive. You would want to, in a, in a child that had that, you would want to order an ANA, okay? That would be a useful screening test, okay? A chest x-ray. Okay, so, you know, Dr. Ricks, you're consulted, you know, in the, over at Primary Children's Hospital with this five-year-old girl with red eyes, but you also notice this desquamative rash. And, uh, you know, Desclamation in the groin and kind of a and cherry lips. Uh, I think, uh, 
So Stephen Johnson, Kawasaki, uh, the person who come to mind with the red lips and red fingers. Great, excellent. So Kawasaki is, is pretty unusual, but it's kind of a board type thing. Stevens Johnson would be maybe a little bit less common in a kid, right? Um, but certainly, you know, a patient who has an exposure or toxic shock or something like that. But, so mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome, usually in kids, you know, less than 10, systemic manifestation, as we've seen here. Um, you know, uh, oral and mucosal erythema, fever, painless asymmetric cervical adenopathy. So the big thing is myocarditis and coronary arteritis, right, that can be life-threatening. Usually the ocular manifestations are pretty minimal, but usually a bilateral conjunctivitis and it characteristically spares the, limit, the limbus. Um, and you see it in the first week. There can be uh, optic disc edema and dilated veins, okay? Moving along, so you guys know who this is, right? This person up on the left. No? Died this year, last year? Yeah, okay, it's David Bowie, right? So David Bowie had heterochromia, okay? But it was due to trauma when he was young. If you look at his pupils, close he's got a, you know, um, he's got a blue right eye and a brown left eye, in any case. So iris heterochromia, Fuchs heterochromia, iris cyclitis. I'm dating myself. I don't know. Can I tell you? So Fuchs is something I like to ask about. It's also called Fuchs uveitis syndrome. Okay. So the findings, you know, iris heterochromia, the lighter iris uh, color in a brown eye or darker blue, darker iris in blue eyes, because you have the anterior uh, pigment layer is, is gone. They describe these so-called stellate KP, okay? So they actually look like little stars, and uh, they're distributed usually throughout the cornea. The, uh, cataracts and elevated pressure are very common, okay? Um, and uh, another board question is, uh, patient has, you know, uh, iris heterochromia, and uh, they uh, have high pressure, and you do a, you know, paracetesis on the patient and they have high pain. What's happening? Um, there, that's a so-called Amsler sign. Uh, patients with Fuchs can have these little iris vessels in the angle that can bleed. You can also see that during cataract surgery. So it's usually unilateral, okay? And recently it's been shown, there's been a lot of literature on Fuchs, right? It's Ernst Fuchs described this in the 1800s. Um, but I, there's been pretty convincing uh, you know, molecular data to suggest that rubella is idiopathogenic in this. And the incidence of uh, Fuchs has decreased dramatically since people have been immunized. Okay. Other associations for non-board questions, okay? So frequently you see these kind of uh, toxo-like scars in, in the periphery. Okay. So toxoplasmosis is also associated with that. Um, some of the characteristic findings is the absence of posterior sneakia, okay, as opposed to the presence of posterior sneakia in a, in a patient with chronic low-grade uveitis. There is frequently a chronic low-grade uveitis that does not seem to form posterior sneakia. Okay, so chasing after half plus or one plus cell in a patient with Fuchs accelerates their cataract by dosing them with steroids, okay, and enhances their IOP. So that's the one instance in which you might not want to, you know, really be aggressive in treating that anterior uveitis. Okay. The other thing is the other uh, question that sometimes arises is, uh, as far as cataract surgery is concerned, with intraocular lens implantation, um, it's not, you know, it's not a no-brainer to put a lens in an eye with uveitis, right? Um, so there would be certain kind of indications to do that. But the diagnosis that is associated with the best prognosis for toleration of an intraocular lens is Fuchs therapy or dyslexia. Okay, so what's what do you do next for this five-year-old patient with oligoarticular ANA, GIA associated iridocyclitis that's unresponsive to topical steroids? With methotrexate, right. I think that's right. So you wouldn't want to just give them unopposed steroids to place a child, especially at risk for 
uh, systemic steroids, growth retardation is a consideration. And you want, you know that they're unresponsive to topical corticosteroids. You might give them <coughs> systemic corticosteroids if it's severe in both eyes as bridging therapy for methotrexate. So you, the early implementation of uh, steroid sparing therapy in a step ladder algorithm is you know, usually an anti-metabolite first, and then if they don't tolerate or don't respond well to an anti-metabolite, which occurs in about 40% of the time, uh, then you move on to usually a biologic. So uh, Humira, which has recently been approved, or infliximab would be the next step after that. Okay, so we have this teenager that presents with bilateral anterior uh, chamber cell and flare, vitritis, after about a fevers, arthralgias, increased serum creatinine, and eosinophiluria. Bilateral, 19-year-old female, a little vitritis. What are you thinking about in this patient? Tino. Hmm? Tino. Tino. Yeah, right, exactly. So uh, visceral larval migraine associated with toxoplasmosis is a cutaneous diagnosis, right? GIA uh, can be bilateral, uh, but usually not associated with high fevers and eosinophilia. TINU is associated with fevers and arthralgias, increased serum creatinine. Now, right here, UVA is usually symptomatic, correct? Unlike the GIA? Correct. Usually they are, right? And it can be actually quite severe. Yeah. yeah. So about 11% of patients, you know, uh, will require you know, immunomodulation in some large series. Okay, here's a uh, young woman that presents with floaters, snowbank and snowballs with episodic paresthesis. So we're kind of moving along anatomically in the uveitis world, okay, from the front to the, to the middle of the eye, so-called intermediate type of uveitis, right? Okay, so intermediate uveitis is not the same as pars planitis, okay? Intermediate uveitis just designates an anatomic uh, location for inflammation, okay, in the uh, vitreous peripheral retina and peripheral retina and usually peripheral vessels, okay, and intermediate uveitis can be associated with systemic disease, as we will see in this moment. When it is not associated with systemic disease, we call it parsimonitis, basically, okay? So you would describe intermediate uveitis if the patient had a diagnosis of sarcoidosis, which is certainly in the differential, intermediate uveitis associated with sarcoidosis, uveitis, intermediate uveitis associated with multiple sclerosis. So characteristically, patients will have peripheral vasculitis, uh, as you can see obviously in the color, and then uh, the fluorescent angio angiogram shows it sometimes more uh, distinctly, particularly with wide field fluorescent angiography and macular edema are common accompaniments. So as I mentioned, it can be associated with systemic conditions such as multiple sclerosis, sarcoidosis, always considered, and syphilis, of course. Lyme disease, as we were talking about last night, uveitis all the time. We were in our little conference last night. Lyme is actually uh, the most frequent presentation. Of, uh, uh, its most frequent presentation is in uh, intermediate uveitis in patients that are in endemic areas. So if a patient comes in, you know, I was hiking and I've got this targetoid tick bite here, which we'll see shortly, and that's diagnostic. That skin lesion is diagnostic of Lyme disease. And then there are uncommon mimics, okay, or uncommon conditions that can produce intermediate uveitis, such as a fungal endophthalmitis, cat scratch disease, uh, toxoplasmosis, you know, in a very peripheral lesion. And then <clears throat> non-inflammatory uh, uh, infectious disease such as Ogner ischemic syndrome, unilateral uh, peripheral vasculitis, and, and inflammation associated with ischemia. So we want to exclude uh, uh, syphilis, sarcoid, and TB, Lyme serology when appropriate. So here it might not be appropriate or without history. And then consider a neurological workup. That's a discussion for you know, a lecture Okay, but um, there is an association that you should know about between pars planitis and the development of multiple sclerosis. It's about a 16% risk, okay, particularly in HLA-DR 
patients in five years, okay? That does not mean that everybody's gonna get multiple sclerosis or that you should freak your patients out and tell them that they're gonna get multiple sclerosis because that is a clinical diagnosis, right? Um, and the McDonald criteria, I think, require, you know, separated neurological events separated in time, right? So um, the issue is, do you scan everybody? You know, and I don't do that. Most people don't. It doesn't really make sense to do that because even if you scan them and you find these little things there, then many times the neurologists won't treat them. So it's a controversial area. Unless they have something that uh, tips them over. So you will notice in the clinic, the patients with intermediate uveitis, you know, when we're taking a history, we always ask them about signs and symptoms of MS, okay, paresthesias, bladder bowel incontinence, you know, et cetera, optic neuritis, obviously. But when they come in for follow-up, I ask them those questions again, just to make sure because, you know, you don't know if they will develop it or not, okay? So wide-field fluorescein angiography is becoming actually very useful and maybe confounding and uh, confusing in this diagnosis in terms of you know, how aggressively to treat patients because many patients who are normal will have a little staining and maybe a little leakage in the peripheral retina. And it's difficult to know what to do that with that parastinitis patients. So from my perspective, if a patient is seeing well and has no macular edema and is asymptomatic and has some staining of their peripheral vessels in the, in the periphery but not you know, uh, posterior to the equator, I would observe that. A word about sarcoidosis, um, it can cause any type of uveitis, okay? 25% um, of sarcoidosis, you know, may have uveitis at some point in time during their uh, course of their disease. The, the organs affected, pretty much any organ, but usually, but in order of frequency, lung, skin, reticular, endothelial, right, lymph nodes, and eye. Um, you know, the use of ACE and lysozyme is a little bit controversial. I think it's useful in patients that have um, signs of granulomas anterior uveitis, and if they're elevated, okay, along with, uh, um, it just kind of puts you in, in the ballpark, but it's not necessary, okay, because really the diagnosis of sarcoidosis is, is based on, you know, biopsy. And uh, if, if you were the most, as you'll see in a minute, the most useful screening test is the chest x-ray. Okay? The other thing that is often overlooked is that sarcoidosis can affect the liver and that not infrequently transaminases will be elevated in patients with sarcoidosis. So it's useful to look at those. Um, ACE is confounding in patients that are on ACE inhibitors, right? In children, the ACE can be physiologically elevated. Um, a lot of UBS, Specialists will order it. I order it frequently, but I don't place a whole lot of weight in it. Okay. Chest X-ray is abnormal in 90% of patients with active disease. Okay, there are going to there are patients that um, have signs uh, of sarcoidosis on their on their ophthalmic examination that may have a apparently normal chest X-ray. So your clinical suspicion is still present for sarcoidosis. In those patients, ordering a CT chest uh, with thin cuts is actually a sensitive test to pick up disease that may be missed on chest x-ray. Okay, that hasn't been completely vetted, but uh, there's good evidence to suggest that's the case. So non-caseating granuloma is typical for sarcoidosis, but not you know, there are other things that can give you a non-casing granuloma, right? Um, it is useful in patients with sarcoidosis uh, to look for areas other than the lung to biopsy to make your diagnosis. So not infrequently, patients will have skin lesions, okay? So lupus perineal is a common finding in patients with sarcoidosis. You can make the diagnosis with a skin biopsy, a little less invasive than doing a bronchial pillar lavage or directed biopsy of the, of the lymph node. Uh, likewise, um, the lacrimal gland is a useful place. The conjunctiva can be actually a useful site for biopsy. Um, you know, a, about 20% of patients, 15% uh, of patients will have the conjunctival nodules. And uh, biopsy of the nodule may be uh, diagnostic, but blind biopsy of the conjunctiva is not diagnostically useful. So you may get a consultation from 
you know, pulmonary or whatever, and say, would you do a conjunctival biopsy to exclude the diagnosis of sarcoidosis? Look at the patient if they have a nodule, that's fine, but otherwise it's not very useful. So here are, you know, some just pictures of uh, the multi multitude of findings that you can see in patients with uh, sarcoidosis. Just put this international workshop criteria up that there are there are categories uh, that have not been you know completely verified for you know de for the diagnosis de definite presumed probable and possible uh, you know so definite is biopsy positive presumed is uh, compatible with bilateral adenopathy so there are going to be patients that have bilateral that have uh, hyalur adenopathy um, that have stage one disease okay that pulmonary is not going to want to treat Okay, that are doing fine with their uh, with their pulmonary function test, but they've got uveitis. So you know the organ system that is driving the inflammation guides treatment. And then probable, uh, that's the kind of more sticky category. Okay, so that's where you have you know uh, no hyalur adenopathy biopsy, nothing to biopsy, and then signs and laboratory investigations, and about 60% of these patients will be positive. And then, then there's the possible. So, you know, I, the chest physicians, uh, you know, insist that, and I think that they're right, that, you know, I mean that uh, sarcoidosis is, is, is a multi-organ system disease, okay? And that um, it's difficult to just make the disease just on the eye findings alone, okay? So it requires more than one site. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just in terms of uh, signs, okay, that are useful. Okay, so these are these ten, and you can read this paper here. It's actually quite good. Okay, these kind of tent-like uh, anterior sneakia that's common in patients with sarcoidosis. Okay, higher magnification. You can have these tache de bage. Sorry, I, my French is horrible. But candle wax drippings. Okay that are exudates around the uh, veins. Periphlebitis is a very common finding in patients with sarcoidosis, you can see here. Then you can have these accumulations of uh, inflammatory exudates, otherwise known as snowballs, okay, in the inferior parts of planus. So hence, you know, the differential diagnosis of intermediate UBIs. And then not infrequently and characteristically, these kind of whitish quarter retinal spots, particularly in the inferior periphery. What's the diagnosis? I'm coming from New Jersey, I got it. You know, or Long Island. Okay, it's Lyme disease. What is the name of this? Erythema migrans. Erythema migrans, right. So in the correct you know, context, that's diagnostic of Lyme disease. We were talking about this last night, about serology and uh, you know, Western blot, which is necessary for the diagnosis. But this is, is diagnostic. Okay. Huh? It might be an orphan. It's not butt crack. Or the body of the butt? Oh. That? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Nasty. Uh, all right, so Lyme disease. I don't know why. So, um, <laughs> wow. That's usually where my head's gone, you know? <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe it. <laughs> we always inject patients about cracks in clinic. You gotta do that. You gotta, you gotta do that. Drop them. You know, you guys have been in clinic with me. Close the door, okay. So, Lyme disease, um, you know, tick-borne illness, uh, endemic to Northeast and Mid-Atlantic and Upper Midwest. So kids that kids are more susceptible. They're playing in you know the brush, and I guess older people. Uh, and there are systemic stages, just like there are of syphilis. So it's a spirochetal disease. Okay, early erythema migrans is an early sign. Then disseminated fever meningitis, Bell's palsy, which is a very common sign. Seventh nerve palsy is Lyme disease in an endemic area of sarcoidosis. Yeah. Arrhythmia is an arthritis, which are serious, and then persistent, usually neurologic disease. So there are many, many uh, manifestations, okay, and it depends on the, st on the stage of the disease. So early, 
in the stage of the disease, um, conjunctivitis is the most common, anterior uveitis, but intermediate uveitis is probably the most common presentation. You can have a posterior uveitis with vasculitis. Clinical diagnosis is important along with supportive serology and PCR with Western blotting. Um, the differential diagnosis in a child is JIA, and then treatment is with IV antibiotics at neurologic doses just like syphilis. Right? Okay, so the hallmark present, presenting sign of intermediate uveitis is fibrin in the anterior chamber, posterior sneakia, vitreous cells, punched up peripheral choroidal revolutions. All at once? C, right. So it's, it's, not, it's a disease mostly of the, of the vitreous and peripheral retina, right? In children, you can get an anterior uveitis, but usually not with fibrin. So that's the, I think fibrin would be more associated with a B27 associated disease. Um, sarcoid uveitis is characterized by non granulomous anterior uveitis, chronic granulomous anterior uveitis, granulomous pan uveitis. You can do anything, okay? So syphilis is a great masquerader. Sarcoidosis is a great, great masculator. TB is a great masculator. 25-year-old okay. white female horse rider from Long Island, you know where this is going, you know, uh, presents with bilateral intermediate uveitis. So, you know, the clues are in here, right? So from an endemic area, uh, peripheral phlebitis without, you know, snowbanks. Not that that's uh, necessarily important. Um, in addition, you know, so we're talking about the differential diagnosis of intermediate uveitis from a person who's in an endemic area for Lyme. So you would want to order Lyme serology on this patient. That's basically the idea. Okay. Right, okay, so we kind of talked about uh, this entity last night. So this is um, a patient, actually it was a patient, it was a real patient of mine, that uh, really nice guy that used to do a lot of traveling I uh, was, you know, worked for the LDS Church, was in Nepal, Thailand, Myanmar, actually, um, and presents with, actually, this is, you know, five days after his presentation, but he presented to me with a rule-out vein occlusion, okay, branch retinal vein occlusion. You can see that he has areas of retinal whitening, retinal vasculitis, okay, and vitreous, his media is not clear, okay, um, and some intraretinal hemorrhage. Uh, he has acute retinal necrosis syndrome. So just a word about the differential diagnosis of multifocal retinitis and vasculitis. You, know, you think about the necrotizing herpetic retinopathies, ARN and PORN, which is a, just a variant of that. We were talking about this briefly, non-necrotizing herpetic retinopathy. But then CMB, toxo, syphilis, sarcoid, TB. So those, the top four entities, okay, um, are you know the major players okay and things that you need to exclude and when a patient comes in with a retinitis particularly um, it, it, you know at any time okay it gets more difficult and more uh, dicey when the patient's immunocompromised okay because then you have broader differential diagnosis and then the history is very important for risk factors for other things that can cause endophthalmitis that is endogenous such as IV drug abuse previous surgery <clears throat> you know iatrogenic immunosuppression. So the clinical features of ARN, uh, it usually presents two-thirds of the time unilaterally, but can be bilateral, so-called BARN, bilateral acute retinal necrosis. Patients present with acute decrease in vision pain, redness, photophobia, floaters, elevated intraocular pressure, right? Herpetic, hypertensive uveitis, granulomatous uveitis, and the fellow eye can be involved in one to six weeks or up to 20, it's been described up to 20 years. In the acute phase, you have these multiple yellow white dots, usually in the periphery, as you can see here, okay? They're so-called thumbprints in the periphery that coalesce rapidly, okay, within a matter of days, and progress centripetally to the posterior fold. Okay, so the hallmarks are retinitis, okay, vitritis, sorry, and uh, occlusive vasculitis, okay, usually in arteritis. So those are the diagnostic criteria 
uh, clinical diagnostic criteria that have been elaborated by the American UBS Society. So ARN is a clinical diagnosis. Okay? Um, other things that you can see are optic nerve edema, retinal hemorrhages, cortical thickening. And then if you do nothing, it resolves in two to three months, but it, you know, it can resolve like that, okay, without treatment. So widespread necrosis with multiple holes uh, and uh, a very high instance of tractional uh, retinal detachment. You can usually combine tractional regmatogenous, which is, which is very difficult to fix. Okay? Optic atrophy is also, I think, an important uh, sequela of this disease that can actually occur even with good treatment okay, and can adversely affect the visual outcome. These are the diagnostic criteria I mentioned, retinitis, occlusive vasculitis, and then inflammation. Okay? Um, PCR is extremely useful and highly sensitive and specific in confirming the diagnosis, but you don't wait for the result of the PCR in order to initiate therapy. Okay? So it's positive in the earlier stages of the disease. Um, Usually varicella and uh, uh, herpes simplex type 1 you see in older patients that mean at 40 years, and then you can be infected with herpes simplex type 2, usually younger patients. There is a uh, potential for concurrent CNS involvement, particularly with herpes simplex. Okay? So that's extremely important because that can you know, kill the patient, right? And uh, if there is any neurological involvement, I would get neurology involved and have the patient admitted to the hospital for intravenous acyclovir as opposed to oral acyclovir injections of fluid, as we'll just discuss. So the conventional regimens, IV acyclovir, uh, you know, 10 milligrams every eight hours or 1,500 milligrams you know, per meter squared. And then after two weeks or 10 to 14 days of this, transition them to um, oral antiviral medication, acyclovir or equivalent. Many people will place patients on an aspirin at the time of therapy because it, to help prevent the occlusive vasculitis, though I'm, I'm not sure that that does help, but you know, I think it's worthwhile doing. Do you do that? Yeah. Um, the big problem, one of the big problems is involvement of the fellow eye, okay, which can be reduced significantly, um, you know, uh, in a year by treating the patient with antiviral therapy after you've treated them with the uh, with high doses of acyclovir. Okay, the study was I think for three months, but you know I, I keep them, keep patients on it almost indefinitely, particularly if they have a bad outcome in the, in the fellow line. The regimens uh, include um, you know valcyclovir or equivalent valgancyclovir is also effective. Okay, patients with CMV. And then intravitreal therapy with phosphornet or gancyclovir or both. Okay. Typically, and then uh, after the patient has been on antiviral therapy for usually you know 12 to 24 hours, these patients usually have a lot of inflammation in their eyes, so I start them on prednisone. Um, retinal detachment is common. Uh, prophylactic barrier photocoagulation is controversial, though. I do perform it. I'm glad that I have done it in many eyes because they had these big areas of detachment that have been prevented uh, from it. Um, and then a vitrectomy uh, for the complications. Uh, there's been some talk, some, some studies about using vitrectomy prophylactically. I'm not convinced that that's a good idea in, in these eyes, okay, particularly since they're young, their vitreous is attached, their eyes are hot. It's complicated surgery whether or not you do it prophylactically or uh, therapeutically when they have detachment. The uh, you know, prognosis is horrible if it's not treated, but it's better and pretty good if, if they are treated. But although, you know, there is tremendous variation in the literature, I think, in terms of the visual outcome. Um, just for your information, I mean, when a patient comes in, and I'm pretty convinced that they have ARN and they're and they, I don't need to admit them or perform a vitreous biopsy. I perform a, a uh, aqueous tap, usually, uh, and then administer intravitreal therapy at the same time. Start them on uh, antiviral medication uh, and steroids the following day. I might 
treat them with anti-toxoplasmic medication if I can't see the lesions and I'm not convinced that they don't have toxoplasmosis. So all that is done up front before the, before the AC uh, result of the aqueous is, uh, PCR is back. <coughs> Sorry, so this is a 16-year-old African male with this focal area of retinitis. Okay. Um, vision's down, they have detritus, um, low back pain, shortness of breath. Okay. They have a little vasculitis, I think, maybe you can see that, near the uh, lesions themselves. So the differential diagnosis of focal retinitis you know, in an otherwise healthy person is toxoplasmosis, younger person, toxochoriasis, you know, um, and then the others here. Um, this patient's laboratories were, we, uh, was very positive for uh, a high IgG of toxoplasma. Okay, so it makes the diagnosis, I think the clinical diagnosis is toxo is number one in my mind although I don't see a discrete satellite lesion in that, that patient. Um, and the IgG was certainly uh, suggestive. It's not a confirmatory diagnosis because the prevalence of toxoplasmosis in the population is high. Okay, so classical treatment regimen um, is daraprim or pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine, folinic acid. And then steroids after the initiation of antimicrobial therapy if there is significant detritus. And we treat for about four to six weeks in an immunocompetent patient. Patients that are immunosuppressed may need chronic antimicrobial uh, uh, treatment. This is the evolution of this particular lesion. Okay, and you can see that they did actually have a, a, a coronal scar before. So who do you treat? Okay, Some uh, small active peripheral lesions may be observed. Okay, So if the patient has 20, 30 vision, a small amount of retritis in a tiny little area, you know, peripherally, you might observe that patient, okay? Usually I treat most patients that come in, okay, in order to limit the scar size. Treatment is certainly recommended for any lesions affecting the macula, the optic nerve, or a large blood vessel, significant vitritis, and certainly in any patient's immunocompromised, okay? Um, a, something that is important to think about in an immunocompromised patient, particularly in AIDS patients, if they, have, if they are immunosuppressed and they have a toxoplasma lesion that's classic, okay, they may not have a classic toxoplasma lesion. They may have a lesion that mimics CMV retinitis because of the immunosuppression. But if they have toxoplasmosis, you need to image in your brain because about 10 to 15% of those patients will have CNS toxo. Okay. Um, so the alternative treatment regimens include clinda and sulfadiazine together, okay? Uh, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxyl, or Bactrim twice a day is actually a good uh, treatment and has not been shown to be inferior to other treatments, although um, I usually use it in patients that have non-macular you know, threatening lesions. Personally, I usually use the combination of azithromycin with or without pyrimethamine or a tovaquone for patients with posterior pole threatening lesions, or intravitreal clindamycin and dexamethasone. We were discussing that last night. I mean, frequently patients with toxoplasmosis, you know, they're uh, uninsured, uh, they have bad inflammation in their eye, they're the certain, their follow-up is gonna be uncertain, you know, you wanna treat them. You know? <coughs> and uh, whether or not they're gonna be able to afford medications is another thing. You are aware of the fact that the makers of the newly acquired owners of Daraprim increased the price of that by like a thousand percent, right? So this is uh, atypical uh, presentation. So here's you know the Rene Choi you know uh, picture up and to the left. That's you know everybody would no one would uh, you know mistake that for toxoplasmosis, but it can look like like the lesion to the right, it's more diffuse, you know, uh, uh, and then you can have actually acquired toxoplasmosis like the guy down the bottom to the left, he had an acquired macular lesion with no peripheral scar, okay? No previous history, and then here's this brain lesion patient with AIDS. Um, so here are a couple of toxoplasma 
quiz questions. Most toxoplasmosis um, is congenital disease, true or false? So false, recent epidemiologic studies suggest that the majority of toxoplasmosis is acquired uh, and much of it is acquired postnatally. Okay, acquired disease comes from eating undercooked beef or exposure to cats, true or false? False. Mostly false, right, okay. So uh, usually not beef, okay, litter, kit, kitty litter, game usually, uh, and then contaminated vegetables and water. Okay, I think that probably water is probably the most common, most important. Okay, ocular toxin plasma is a clinical diagnosis, laboratory testing is supportive only. Uh, I would say mostly, mostly true. true. Okay, you know, nothing's always <laughs> true, right? <laughs> okay, so it's supportive, it certainly can be supportive in an immunocompromised patient, right? Okay, you, okay. so mostly true, you know, uh, um, negative IgG is helpful, okay? So if you have a negative test, you know, it doesn't have toxoplasmosis, okay? Um, but a positive PCR, you know, is supportive. Say, for example, in the picture that I showed you before, the atypical presentation, just, you know, widespread retinitis, that can be toxoplasmosis in an immunocompromised patient, particularly in an AIDS patient, right? So you can perform PCR in a vitreous fluid or obtain serology, which is less helpful, okay, that may help you in the diagnosis. Even under the best of circumstances, PCR for toxoplasmosis is not that uh, sensitive. Right? Specific, but not that sensitive. What's this? What category is this? Just neuroretinitis, neuroretinitis right? So you have uh, you know, swollen nerve and a partial macular scar, right? What's the most common cause of neuroretinitis? This is a board question. So Bartonella, right. So cat scratch disease uh, is caused by Bartonella hensleyae and Bartonella quintana. There are like seven different Bartonella species, but these, those are the two that cause the most disease. Um, you see it mostly in kids. Um, so there is a systemic component, so there is an erythemic papule of the inoculation spike from the, from the cat scratch. Um, and a flu-like Ill illness with regional adenopathy. That's useful information. Ocular disease uh, occurs in about 10% of the patients with either paranoid ocular glandular syndrome or neuroretinitis, okay? So the picture that I showed you before with neuroretinitis, there's also, there are other variants of neuroretinitis, right? So this isn't a lecture about neuroretinitis per se, it's just a brief board type of thing. But neuroretinitis, it can also be idiopathic, so-called Labor, labor stellate neuroanitis, but it can also be caused by a lot of other organisms, including toxoplasmosis, syphilis, so you have to, and vascular disease, okay, hypertension. Okay. So the, there's a broad differential infections, so I'm saying here, um, so syphilis, Lyme, TB, Dusen, you know, herpes, sarcoid, and then vascular, vascular disease, right, hypertension, diabetes, AION, pseudotumor. Uh, the thing is that the natural history of cat scratch associated with Bartonella is good, okay? So most of the patients recover visual acuity 2025 without treatment. However, there are patients that do poorly, and those patients need to be treated with systemic disease. So some kids will have bad systemic disease from cat scratch disease, and um, they will be treated with, you know, usually rifampin, okay? I don't like to use doxycycline, you know, in kids. Okay, so peripapillary scarring punched out mid-peripheral scars and choroidal vascularization. No vitreous cells. What is that diagnosis? This is a poor question. C. Pose. Okay, ocular histoplasmosis syndrome, right? So presumed ocular histoplasmosis syndrome has these characteristics uh, with no vitritis, okay? If there was vitritis, what would the diagnosis be for the purpose of board examination? Multifocal choroiditis and panuvianus. Okay. Um, this is a patient with birdshot. Um, you can see these 
creamy type of lesions in the chorae, okay? Um, usually concentrated around the optic nerve. They usually have a mild vitritis, okay? And pretty good visual acuity. Um, the angiogram uh, is more useful in showing the vasculitic component of the disease and optic nerve involvement. Uh, the lesions themselves are not usually very highlighted by because of there's heterogeneity in the lesion and their age. Um, whereas ICG, as you can see on the right, shows lesions more clearly. Um, so the major differential diagnosis is sarcoidosis. Okay, so the absence of hyalur adenopathy is important. In the initial description of birdshot, the absence of a snowbank is also important. HLA-829 is associated with 95 to 98% of patients with the diagnosis of birdshot. Um, but 8% uh, of the population is positive for HLA-829, okay? So screening patients with HLA-829 is not a useful screening test because the positive predictive value of that test would be like 50%. The negative predictive value of a negative HLA-829 in a patient that has a picture like that is useful because it's probably not sarcoid, uh, probably not birdshot, it may be something like sarcoid or lymphoma. Um, this is a 31-year-old healthy woman uh, with a uh, history of fever, prodrome, malaise, rash, red eye, decreased vision, history of UTI. Okay, characteristic placoid lesions in the back of the eye. This is, I'm just trying to put stuff up there that they may ask you about the board. So this is AMPI. Okay. Um, usually AMPI has a little bit of cells in the back of the eye, some vitreous uh, cell and haze. Um, usually occurs in uh, young, otherwise healthy patients um, and is usually bilateral disease. Okay. Um, Chest x-ray is normal, the labs are usually with normal limits. There's a characteristic angiographic uh, picture of AMPI, which you can see here with early blockage and late standing of lesions. Okay. ICG just shows hypofluorescence of the lesions, okay. suggesting that the disease is in the choroid or the choriocapillaris. Um, I think that there's been a lot of controversy as to whether where the disease actually is. And OCT, high resolution OCT, and I think OCTA suggest that the disease is induced in the corial capillaris. Okay. Um, uh, just a word about. And this is the only thing that can kill you. Yeah, right. The, the word about AMPI is that patients can develop CNS disease. Okay? So if a patient has any signs of CNS disease, they need to be hospitalized. So there's you know, controversy about treatment of AMPI. A lot of people will say, oh, it doesn't need to be treated. Their, their visual, their outcome is good. 80% of people you know, have visual acuity better than 2080, at 2040 or better. Um, there is no evidence to suggest that you know, uh, treatment you know, really alters the uh, outcome, visual outcome. But it does make it go get better faster and I think may limit you know, the amount of scarring that occurs. So when these lesions heal, they heal with hyperpigmentation. If you have lesions in the macula, okay, and it can be associated with serous retinal detachment, I think it's reasonable to treat them with serous. Certainly anybody with CNS disease needs to be treated. We've answered this question. Birdshot retinal cordopathy is associated with, what's the, mo the most common cause of visual loss in patients with birdshot is macular edema. Iris nodules and posterior synchia, they don't usually get it. Vitiligo of the eyelid is characteristic of VKH. Okay. Cordial vascularization can be seen with all of these diseases except which one? A. Yeah, so JIA is an anterior uveitis, right? usually not that. Serpiginous like choroiditis. The key is serpiginous like choroiditis, okay? Is what? B. Right, exactly. Okay. So it's associated with the TB. This is a patient with a multifocal cortis due to sympathetic ophthalmia. So, you know, 
I went to a, a UVI subspecial of the day once, and uh, the lecturer was charged with, um, you know, talking about the difference between VKH and sympathetic ophthalmia, and got up and said, trauma, and walked off the stage. Okay, so it's pretty much true. Okay, so a history of trauma or surgery, you know, is, is required for the diagnosis of sympathetic ophthalmia, okay? Uh, they frequently have similar uh, findings, including vitiligo, poliosis, and alopecia. For board purposes, and I mean for board purposes only, okay, the chorio capillaris is involved in patients with BKH and not in sympathetic ophthalmia. Okay? It probably is involved if given enough time. Okay. So, I'm not going to. This is a patient with an exuded retinal detachment, okay, due to VKH. Your findings that are typical of patients with VKH they include poliosis okay, and uh, vitiligo, okay, and uh, there's another sign called Segura sign. Are you familiar with that, Dr. Choi? Yeah, what is Segura sign? That's where you get around the limbus. Right. So perilimbal vitiligo is seen more commonly in Japanese patients. Another board question, right? So the characteristic fluorescein finding in patient with um, BKH is the punctate areas of hyperfluorescence, which increases in intensity, leak and pool, okay, causing these uh, neurosensory attachment. Are you all seeing that, Dr. Rex? If left untreated or not treated aggressively early enough, this is what you see in patients with VKH, the subrental fibrosis and scarring. Um, there's no history of ocular trauma or surgery, and then three of the following four signs. It's a bilateral disease, okay? I th it can present asymmetrically, okay? But if you have unilateral exudative retinal detachment, it's not VKH, right? So it's bilateral disease. Posterior uveitis with exudative attachment sunset globe fundus, which is a later sign of the disease, neurological signs, um, tinnitus and stiffness, cranial nerve or CNS problems, which are more acute signs, and cutaneous findings such as alopecia, poliosis, and vitiligo, which are cicatricial or late findings. Okay. This is a differential diagnosis of exuded retinal attachment in uveitis. Okay. It's actually useful to think about that. So, Posterior sclerosis is something you may not think about initially, okay? Syphilis, central serous, certainly. Uvula fusion syndrome, sympathetic lymphoma, sarcoid. Okay? So this is the differential of Dale and Fuchs nodules. You can see it in sympathetic ophthalmia, but you can also see it in BKH. You can also see them in sarcoid and TB. This is a uh, hypopian uveitis in a patient with Bechet's disease, okay? Bechet's disease typically causes a vasculitis, which is occlusive, which you can see here with large areas of non-perfusion, which is actually very prognostic for the um, visual uh, prognosis, and chalky white areas of retinitis. Okay, ocular findings, uh, occlusive retinal vasculitis, vascular occlusions, cottonwool spots, neovascularization, patrice hemorrhage. Um, 100% of patients have oral and mucous membrane ulcers, okay? Erythema nodosum is classically de described uh, in uh, Bechet's disease, although probably an acneiform follicular rash is more common. Uh, thrombophlebitis, arthritis, large vegetal occlusion, um, uh, including DVT, and uh, CNS disease. This is a large aptus ulcer in a patient with Bechet's. Um, differential diagnosis of oral ulcers, iridocyclitis, and arthritis. This is useful, I think. Bechet's uh, reactive arthritis and sarcoid. Um, this is something you probably won't see, but you know it's a board type of thing. This is a let's just for sake of discussion. This is a person from the Indian subcontinent, okay, that presents with you know this kind of vitreous hemorrhage. And the vascularization in the periphery. Okay. okay, so 
it's a so-called ill disease or idiopathic retinal vasculitis that is thought to be due to hypersensitivity reaction to tubercular protein. Okay. Um, so high prevalence in Southeast Asia and India, men greater than women. Um, high proportion of patients have a positive PPD test. Um, and vitreous hemorrhage uh, and vasculitis are commonly seen. Those patients need to be treated you know, with probably anti-VEGF therapy and laser. Okay. And vitrectomy if they you know, have decreased uh, vision due to vitreous hemorrhage. This is a patient with a multifocal cordyceps, who's a 40-year-old African female immigrant, no fever, chills, weight loss, um, 15 millimeter PPD. So this is a patient with tuberculosis. Okay, this is also tuberculosis. Okay, okay with a large granuloma, as you can see here. This is also tuberculosis with a tuberculoma. They have the many phases of TB. This is also tuberculosis or subrigenous like tuberculosis, okay? So it can produce many different things, okay? It's usually a presumptive diagnosis. Uh, quantiferon gold, just for the purposes of your board examination, quantiferon gold tests latent tuberculosis, not active disease, okay? Um, exposure to the chest x-ray can be normal in patients with tuberculous uh, uh, uveitis or ocular TB. So that extra pulmonary sites are important to consider. This can be a really difficult diagnosis to make. And sometimes you treat the patient empirically with anti-tuberculous treatment. Um, the, uh, if for a patient with established disease, it's usually a four drug regimen, okay? With topical or periactor steroids, depending upon the degree of inflammation. The incidence of TB in the United States is increasing, okay, in a big way, as is syphilis. The quantiferon gold assay, as we talked about, is a uh, uh, screening test you know, for latent tuberculosis. All of these guys have syphilis, okay. I just, syphilis is a great imitator. Oh, the church lady has syphilis yeah. too. In my clinic, the church lady came in with, she was referred in with mutes, okay? She had a rash on her palms, okay? And she had these punctate areas, which I'll show you in a minute, of, uh, of uveitis. And I was talking to her and I asked her, is there any possibility, you know, that you could have a sexually transmitted disease? Because no, but my husband could. And she had syphilis, okay? So her husband gave her. Okay, so the most common, uh, you know, manifestation of syphilis is a posterior uveitis, 50% of the time, but it can produce pretty much anything. There are some characteristic presentations of syphilis that, that you should know about. One is this uh, uh, syphilitic posterior placoid chorderitis that you can see right here. So it's this, this typical kind of area here, okay, with a blocked leading edge and hyperfluorescent you know, later, okay? The other uh, characteristic presentation posteriorly is the patient, the church lady, okay, that had these uh, superficial retinal precipitates, okay? You can also see a optic nerve, just an op optic neuritis, okay? This is a patient that, uh, you know, who is uh, HIV negative but had risk factors, you know, for uh, HIV, but, is presented with uh, optic nerve involvement. So always consider syphilis in your differential diagnosis. Always think about testing a patient for HIV that has syphilis. They, they go together and use both specific and non-specific chuck needle testing. Okay. So I'm just gonna, just the important point with syphilis is that it is a neurological disease okay, and needs to be treated with um, intravenous penicillin G, okay, at neurological doses, not a shot of penicillin in the butt, okay. This is a lady, uh, so in masquerades, uh, and we're almost done, I know we're over time here, okay, but this is a lady that presented with um, vitritis, non-responsive um, 
vitritis and these characteristic subretinal infiltrates. Okay. So, intraocular if she was 60 some odd years old, intraocular lymphoma was a was a uh, very high on our differential diagnosis. Okay. And she um, underwent she, her, she had non-specific white matter changes in her brain. In retrospect, maybe uh, lymphoma. Um, she underwent a vitreous biopsy and uh, subretinal aspirate and had poorly differentiated uh, malignant cells. Okay, so we always think about lymphoma in your differential diagnosis. So here you have a 45-year-old person, not your typical age, right? So it can occur in younger people with unilateral vitritis, unresponsive to corticosteroids. So that immediately is a tip-off, okay? If the patient's getting worse with corticosteroids, you might think about maybe you're thinking about an infection, okay? But if they're unresponsive, you know, um, Think about a masquerade syndrome, no neurologic symptoms, but he had a vitreous biopsy with monomorphic lymphocytes with large nuclei, prominent nuclei, and scanning its cytoplasm, MR and LPA negative. Okay? So this patient has intraocular lymphoma that needs to be treated with intravitreal therapy. So these are just a couple of, uh, patient, a couple of questions on uh, immunomodulation. Uh, that I think you guys probably know. Um, this is an important question, okay? The immunosuppressive medication is most likely to be associated with secondary neoplasia, neoplasia and long-term use is what? Cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide, right? So cytotoxic medications can be associated with increased malignancy and mortality, okay? Complications of biological therapy, okay, Humira and Infliximab include all of these, okay? So all of these have been described, okay? A lupus-like reaction, lymphoma, infections, and exacerbation of demyelinating disease. Can you mitigate that with methotrexate? Not, pardon me? The drug-induced lupus, can you mitigate that with methotrexate? Um, not. Not always, but you give methotrexate in order to reduce the incidence of it, but methotrexate is given more to prevent the formation of anti-chimeric antibody to infliximab, which will reduce the eff efficacy of the medication. Um, the, the last part is on AIDS, okay, and HIV. Uh, so just briefly, the most common opportunistic infection in patients with AIDS is CMV retinitis, okay? You can get syphilis, you can get toxoplasmosis, you get, can get porn, but the most common is CMV. Okay. The advent of heart, of antiretroviral therapy, has reduced the incidence of CMV retinitis significantly, okay? like by 90%. This is what typical CMV looks like in the posterior pole, so-called pizza pie or tomato ketchup uh, retinitis that follows the nerve layer, usually in the arcades. There's another look to CMV, which you can see in the periphery, okay, so-called uh, um, granular type of retinitis that has, that the activity is in the leading edge here. And then you can also see a frosted branch type angiitis associated with that, which you can see here, okay. So um, heart has, you know, reduced the, uh, you know, the, the prevalence and the, uh, and the incidence of new CMV retinitis significantly. Um, we're going to Myanmar tomorrow, we're going to see a lot of, probably maybe less CMV than before, okay? But in the rest, in the developing world, it's still, it's still a problem where people don't have access to medication. They're late presenters and they don't come in until they're sick, so they and frequently will come in with CMV. Um, and then, um, you know, so patients, cutaneous zoster can also be a major problem presenter here. So that's all I got for this. Thank you.